Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we give you all thanks, praise, glory, and honor for having brought us again together before the throne of grace with thanksgiving and praise and to listen to the voice of your spirit as he takes us to the word of God and opens our understanding to the scriptures, O Father. We know that in you we live, move, and have our being. And it is because of your mercies that are new every morning that we are not consumed. Even now we pray in the name of Jesus for your special anointing to destroy yokes of bondage, to open blind eyes, to unstop deaf ears, and Lord, the string of the tongue of people to be loosed so that not only will they hear right, but they will also learn to speak right and the words of their mouth, the meditations of their heart will be acceptable in your sight. Spirit, soul, body, we belong to you, Father. And so we ask for a fresh cleansing to be our portion. May your name be glorified in everything that is said and done. Speak to us, O Father, through the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Today as we continue learning about how to rightly discern the harvest that God sends our way each day. We have seen how important it is to identify persons whom God senses to be the harvest he has intended for us to have and to enjoy in life. Some of them, like I told you, are mentors, teachers, spiritual leaders, pastors, shepherds or overseers of assemblies and in some instances even people who have more experience than we have in life and whom God sends us to learn from and draw from their knowledge and uh, to draw from their expertise so that our lives will be more fruitful and we will learn a lot more from the experiences of those who have done twice as much as we are attempting to do once. Then I also shared with you about the important role parents play as harvests. Children have to learn to understand that parents are not just uh, some add-ons in their life. Parents hold a very, very important position in the overall plan of God. And it's good for children also to continuously remind themselves especially when they have praying godly parents, that it is one of the greatest blessings of all to learn from them the good things that God intends for them to learn and to have in their own life. Today I want to continue talking to you about how any idea planted by the Creator God that has the potential of helping others is very much uh, harvest that God sends the people or into the lives of the people who are waiting for such an idea that can transform their lives and change their lives. Now last week we read from Colossians chapter 3, James chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and studied a couple of things from the word of God that had to do with our own life being transformed by God's word and how one God-inspired idea can trigger so many good things in our life. That is the desire to learn more and more about what is right. The desire to become more and more Christ-like is an idea implanted by God in our lives. Why? Because when that idea is responded to by us, it's God-inspired, it's a God-inspired idea, it's put into us, then we begin to see the necessary changes happening on the inside of us. It is not just an ordinary transformation. It is more of letting the born-again new man dominate every area of our life. And we learn from the scriptures what is expected from the new man. We have to be forgiving, we have to be humble, 
we are to be of like mind we are to harmonize with others in the body of christ we are to walk above all in the god kind of love that never fails we have to be more a person who doesn't hold grudges all these things are so much a part of that god idea that god implants in us that makes us recognize that not only do we have others who come into our life to be the harvest in our lives but we also in turn may in responding to the way the holy spirit leads us be a harvest to someone else be the answer to someone else be the solution to someone else and in that god is glorified because we see like i told you a fulfillment of the abrahamic promise that god gave to abraham when he said in genesis chapter 12 i'll make you a blessing i'll make your name great but i'll also make you a blessing so it's not just me being blessed it's me being a blessing in turn to someone else and that's what we'll be studying today from the life of one beautiful person who has never failed to uh, inspire us every time we study about his life and that is the life of joseph how a god idea how a god idea transformed an entire nation's destiny and how it catapulted a nation that was just one among the nations to being a nation that would be a provider for a host of other nations i want you to turn with me in your bibles to genesis chapter 41 genesis chapter 41 and we're going to read a lot of scripture this evening and i'd like to uh read it to you because in reading these scriptures there's such blessing every time we read the bible when we have the bible with us we have a pen to highlight when we learn the blessed holy spirit gives us such insight of so many nice things from the word of god some things that can help us also understand god's purpose and timing and the way he leads us and the way he guides us and his uh, idea how it can prove to be a blessing to many not necessarily only to one individual but to many come with me to genesis chapter 41 and we're going to read from verses 1 onwards and it came to pass at the end of two full years that pharaoh dreamed and behold he stood by the river now this is the river nile and behold there came up out of the river seven well favored kine and fat fleshed and they fed in a meadow and behold seven other kine came up after them out of the river ill favored lean fleshed and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river and the ill favored lean fleshed kine did eat up the seven well favored and fat kine so pharaoh awoke now i want you to see something there for one this is a very troublesome dream if a lion eat a ox it's part of its nature but for a ox to eat another ox it's not natural so i want you to just make a note when you are writing down supernatural events are often anything that breaks with natural events so this is not a ordinary dream if this person had been dreaming of a lion eating a cow it wouldn't have meant anything here is a dream in which he is seeing cows eating cows it's troubled him he woke up and he slept and dreamed the second time behold seven years of corn came up upon one stalk rank and good and the old seven thin years and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them and the seven thin years 
devoured the seven rank and full years. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. This is the second thing I want you to mark. What was good was eaten up by what was bad. And the most amazing thing is the dream again was not of a man eating the stock of corn. It is corn eating corn. Again, not natural. Something out of the natural. And the Bible says, verse 8, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. I wanted to highlight all these things. That means, now here is a man, he's not a born again man, he's not a saved man, he's not a man who even has any idea about Yahweh, the only true and living God of the Jews. All that he knows is that he is a ruler and he's had a bad dream and it's appeared twice. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt. I wanted to circle the word all. There was not one magician who was bad. Every one of them was called. And Pharaoh told them his dream. But there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Listen very carefully. When a God-sent idea comes, natural men can never understand them. That's number one. Number two, when God sends an idea or a dream or a communication, you need the Holy Spirit to reveal it. Demons cannot reveal it to you. That is the major difference that you must understand between a God-sent word or idea or communication and a demonic idea or something that is sent from the pits of hell. Today, if an idea or a dream or a vision or something comes and somebody is easily able to give the interpretation, you can take it for granted it's not from the Holy Spirit. Remember, if it comes from God, you need the Holy Spirit and He alone to show you the meaning. All the magicians of Egypt were stumped. They had no idea what Pharaoh was talking about. Because all that they knew was lions eat cows. We never heard of cows eating cows. We never heard of corn eating corn. We heard of men eating corn. So what kind of a dream can this be? What kind of uh, dream has this man dreamt of in the night? Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, verse 9, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. I wanted to make a note of all these scriptures because they're very, very essential for us. And it's good for us to see how they are written for us and given to us so that we understand this background very, very clearly. The chief butler is standing there. Just a few months ago, he was in jail, prison. Now he is out. And then he begins to speak. He says... I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream. In one night, I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. There was there with us a young man, a Hebrew, 
a servant to the captain of the guard and we told him and he interpreted to us our dreams to each man according to his dream he did interpret and it came to pass as he interpreted to us so it was me he restored unto my office and him he hanged now even before joseph comes to pharaoh here is the chief butler telling pharaoh pharaoh there is somebody who can be the solution to what you are talking about there's somebody i know who can give you an answer because this is what happened when we were in prison the baker he had a dream the same night i had a dream we went and told it to this hebrew boy or hebrew man and he gave us the interpretation and it happened just like he said i'm here alive while the baker has been hanged because that's what he said would happen verse 14 then pharaoh sent and called joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto pharaoh hastily remember when the favor of god begins to work there will be no waste of time when the god sent idea that is going to become the harvest for somebody's need comes to a place of full ripening there will be no more waste of time i believe this is a very prophetic word for some of you who are listening when the time is ripe you will be in great demand because you will have the answer to people's questions dilemmas needs and desires that's why preparation time is not waste of time preparation time is seed time all that joseph was going through was seed time now the harvest is beginning to manifest he is becoming the harvest and he doesn't yet know what is happening in the palace all that he knows is pharaoh wants to see you and so the bible tells us and pharaoh said unto joseph i have dreamed a dream and there is none that can interpret it and i have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it i have heard i want you to circle that word heard when you become the harvest of blessing for people your fame will precede you not because you did it because but because god's timing begins to release that favor on your life the people begin to talk about you they begin to tell others hey this man or this woman meet her she'll help you she has what it takes to get the job done or he has what it takes to get the job done or he will provide a solution for you why don't you meet him talk to him get his counsel get his advice now let's keep reading and joseph answered pharaoh saying it is not in me god shall give pharaoh an answer of peace beautifully beautifully said god will give pharaoh an answer of peace 
God wants to give you an answer of peace. I want you to mark that down in your Bible. One of the most beautiful statements that Joseph made. He said, your spirit is troubled. But God has the answer. God has the idea. God has the solution. And it will create the peace that you are desiring. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat-fleshed and well-favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean flesh, so as I have never seen in the land of Egypt for badness. I never seen this type of cows. That's what he's saying. They were so thin, skinny. The Amplified Bible reads like this. Uh, or, uh, sorry, I'm reading from the Living Bible. It says, they were skinny and bony. In fact, I've never seen such poor-looking specimens in all the land of Egypt. That's how the Living Bible reads. Poor-looking specimens. I've never seen something like this. And behold, the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind. I want you to understand what Pharaoh is actually revealing. For one is a miracle. I want you to write it down and learn it well. Many times people dream. When they get up, they don't remember their dreams. Or they're never able to vividly remember their dreams. They will talk about a dream which is partly what they thought they dreamt. Very rarely will you ever dream a dream that is so precise that when you get up from your dream, sleep, you're able to replay it just like you saw it. Now, this is what a God idea is like. That. A God idea will not leave you just like that. Remember, a God thought, a God idea, when it comes into you, you can't shake it off. You can't just get up and forget about what you dreamt. If you forget what you dreamt, it is something that came from your own spirit. If you can forget of what you saw, it didn't come from the Holy Spirit. But if it's a God-sent idea, a God-sent dream, you will not forget it. And that's what we see Pharaoh doing here. Now in verse 20, I want you to write it down. I've done it in my Bible already. Write down in verse 20, Pharaoh is revealing in his words the nature of famine. The nature of famine is Famine eats up everything that is good. Write it down. Famine eats up everything that is good. For example, if there's a famine for the word of God, then everything else will dominate and take over what the word of God promises us. That's why there should never be a famine for the word of God. The word of God must be rich and abounding and available. But if there's a famine, remember, a famine, the nature of the famine is the bad takes over and dominates the good. That is the nature of famine. And the only way to break that nature of famine is like we read in the book of Genesis, how Isaac sowed in the time of famine and he reaped a hundredfold return. There is no other way that the Bible tells us that one can break the power of a famine. Even in Elijah's time, the only way that the power of the famine over the widow's household could be broken was when she sowed a seed. So you have to learn about the nature of the famine. The nature of the famine is it eats up everything that is good. So that's why I want you to write it down. When you study this example with me, 
today as we go through the scriptures i believe the holy spirit will open our understanding and he will show us a lot of good things so that we begin to see how to deal with the different things that crop up from time to time in our own lives because joseph's life is a picture of a harvest not only a harvest to pharaoh not only a harvest to egypt but his life is also a harvest to many of us today who draw from his life inspiration and the principles that he left behind that are so powerful because everything that he left behind was very related to a god idea now let me keep reading please so you can see it for yourself have a paper and pen and a highlighter so you can write down and learn what we are going to see verse 22 and i saw in my dream and behold seven years came up in one stalk full and good and behold seven years withered thin and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them and the thin years devoured the seven good years and i told this unto the magicians but there was none that could declare it to me the living bible says all the seven heads of corn were plump and full and the thin heads of corn swallowed up the fat ones this is the nature of famine never underestimate the power of famines when they do come that's why every time the bible tells us about famines in the land it also tells us about the way to overcome a famine the way to overcome a famine is to sow the right seed the way to overcome the famine is to expect a harvest even in the time of famine now that may sound very strange to people who are so tuned into natural things but if you're studying the word of god and you spend time in the word of god faith comes from the word faith doesn't come from your logic faith doesn't come from studying more and more about the famine faith comes from studying the word of god you will get to understand the nature of famine from studying about the effects of the famine but you will never get faith from a famine you get faith from the word of god and so the magicians here the bible says could not declare it to pharaoh they had no interpretation to share with him and joseph said unto pharaoh can you imagine there is no necessity for joseph to say to pharaoh pharaoh let me go pray about it let me spend some time in prayer let me come back with an answer on the spot joseph is standing before pharaoh and giving the interpretation that's why we draw inspiration from the life of joseph and we understand that everything that joseph went through in the past was a type of a preparation and a seed time for a time such as this that is going to manifest as his harvest day look at this place the bible says and joseph said unto pharaoh was 25 the dream of pharaoh is one god had shown pharaoh what he is about to do god has shown pharaoh what he is about to do right close to that verse god idea a god warning a god alert you can put it as a god alert the seven good kind are seven years and the seven good years are seven years the dream is one how can a man straight out of prison just 
be able to flow with the Holy Spirit in a manner like this. This is the most interesting part of the life of Joseph. When God gives you as a harvest to somebody, the words you speak will be Holy Ghost words. The words you speak will be God's word to that situation and to that person. Verse 27, And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty years blasted to the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have sp spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. This is the second time in verse 28, Joseph is bringing Pharaoh's attention back to God. And I want you to mark it in your Bible. Because this is the place most people fail to realize why Joseph is such an inspiration. Today we talk about Christians, they get so carried away that people are listening to them that they don't bring people's attention back to the source from which harvests come. Remember, we're talking about the God of the seed. We're talking about the God of the harvest. Unless God gets his rightful place in a man's life, we will not see blessing. Now, all are so caught up with what this young man is speaking. He's a Hebrew man. He's speaking to Pharaoh something. You can imagine the entire place is listening in rapt attention to his words. All are wondering what he's saying. You can just imagine the way in which he's standing before Pharaoh there are all the courtiers standing on one side. There are also the other magicians. You can call them the opposition. They're standing. They're stumped. They don't know what to say. And here is a stranger coming from prison who has the answer. You can imagine how riled they must have felt. But they're unable to show it. They're all sitting and stand, or standing and listening to what Pharaoh's listening to. Behold, there comes seven years, verse 29, of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land. Have a pen with you and underline that word. The famine shall consume the land. All the plenty shall be forgotten. That means the nature of a famine is it has the power to make you forget all the good that has happened in your life. That's why you must never permit a famine to come into your life where the word of God is absent. Today I, as a pastor, feel it's my duty as a pastor to warn you if you're a church member never 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 cast aside the word of God or think I can read the Bible when I want it but today I'm too busy to have my time to be spent reading the word of God let me do something else I am a busy man. I have no time for prayer any longer. I have no time to read the word of God. When you read the living Bible, the living Bible says even the memory of the good years will be erased. That is why Satan works very, very strongly against the Christian believer to somehow bring some form of a famine into a man's life. Why? Because he wants to erase the memory of God's goodness in your life. 
Today, if you are faced with something that is similar to this situation that is mentioned here, although this is talking about a natural famine in the natural sphere of provision of food, but if you are going through a situation where it looks like the memory of all the good has been erased from your mind, and all you are faced with is a famine, a lack, why? Because the bad has eaten up the good. It's time for you to listen to God and get a God idea that will be the harvest that will take you out of the situation that you are in right now. The Bible says in verse 31, And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. Very grievous famine. Verse 32. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. I wanted to highlight all these things because today we have a lot of people who don't believe in the confirmation that God gives us in the mouth of two or three witnesses. I've been shocked to hear that some people make a mockery of this and say, well, all this is nonsense. It's just some newfound ideas that some people have now all of a sudden, uh, you know, um, started talking about this thing about confirmation. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. It says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That means in the mouth of two or three witnesses. It's not just talking about something. Even in the court of law, one man's testimony is not very valid. It's always more sound to be able to come with the testimony of two witnesses. Even in an ordinary document, when they ask you to sign, they say, we need two witnesses. And how on earth can people make statements that contradict the word of God? Look at Joseph. Joseph is flowing with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, because the dream was doubled, you must know it has been established. Established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Now this is the God idea. I want you to write it down. Write close to that word, God idea. God ideas are harvests. God ideas are words of wisdom and discretion. God's ideas are full of life and life-related thoughts. It's not full of death. It's full of life and life-related thoughts. Now, listen to the God idea. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land Listen, this man was a prisoner. Now he's talking about administrative decisions to be taken by the government under Pharaoh that have to do with the economy of the land. He's never passed out of some great university. He's not had an university education. He doesn't have any doctorate in economics. He is just a person who has submitted himself so much to the Holy Spirit that when the Holy Spirit begins to speak through him, the God idea is so sensible that Pharaoh is taken aback and all the officers are shocked to hear what he's saying because it makes so much of sense. He says, 
and let them take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. The fifth part is talking about the excess crops. So that there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come. Verse 35. Verse 35. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. I want you to highlight all this in your Bible. God is not against storing. God is not against saving. God is not against the principle of saving for a time called famine. He is against hoarding. Hoarding comes from the, from the evil spirit. Saving comes from the Holy Spirit. Today we have a lot of people who attack saving. It's shocking to know that people attack saving because they make it look like it is not a God idea. The Bible says saving is a God idea. I want you to come with me to the book of Proverbs also. Let me read that portion of scripture to you. Proverbs chapter 6. Come with me to Proverbs chapter 6. And let me read to you from verses 1 onwards. Proverbs 6 verses 1 onwards. So if you endorse a note for someone you hardly know, guaranteeing his debt, you are in serious trouble. That means don't be a guarantor for people you don't know. You may have trapped yourself by your agreement. Quick, get out of it if you possibly can. Now I'm reading from the Living Bible. Swallow your pride. Don't let embarrassment stand in the way. Go and beg to have your name erased. That means that is a principle of getting out of being a guarantor to a man who is not proper in his repayments of loans. Don't put it off. Do it now. Don't rest until you do. If you can get out of this trap, you have saved yourself like a deer that escapes from a hunter or a bird from the net. Verse 6. Now this is the place that I want to concentrate on. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy fellow. Learn from their ways and be wise. I want you to write this down, please. For though they have no king to make them work, yet they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you, all you do is sleep. When will you wake up? Let me sleep a little longer. Sure, just a little more. And as you sleep, Poverty creeps upon you like a robber and destroys you. Want attacks you in full armor. I want you to make a note of this verse and come back to Genesis. Come back to the place where we are reading from Genesis chapter 41. Saving is a biblical blessing. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Some people say, oh, I don't believe in saving. That statement of yours may sound spiritual, may sound very, very nice to a lot of people. But in the sight of God, you are saying, I don't believe in what the Holy Spirit is teaching me about how to make it during the winter days. How should I make it when famine strikes? Unless I save, unless I put away something for the time that is to come, a time of evil. Remember, a God idea is your harvest for blessing. Now, 
Let's keep reading. We're not through. Bible says, and verse 36, and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. I want you to highlight verse 36. Genesis 41, verse 36. Genesis 41, verse 36. Let me read to you. It says here in the Living Bible, so that there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come. Otherwise, disaster will surely strike. So famine is always associated with disaster, death. If you want to live during that time, then listen to the God idea. The God idea is not some idea that comes from the bank. The God idea is not an idea that comes from the insurance agent. The God idea is an idea given by God which people have made use of in the world. And effectively they have used it to their own advantage. Whereas the Christian believer who is supposed to depend on that God idea has mocked it, thinking it's a world idea. Because he sees it so much in the world. It's not a world idea. This is a God idea. That's why I told you, write it down in your Bible. God alert. God warning. Next is God idea. A God idea teaches you how to be a biblical saver, not an unholy hoarder. There is a vast difference. Hoarding is done out of fear. Saving is done by faith. That is a major difference between hoarding and saving, and I want you to write it down, please. Saving comes from the Holy Spirit. It is inspired by faith in God, in God's alert, in God's word. Whereas hoarding comes from the evil one. It is demonic. That's why people who hoard will be cursed, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. Hoarding is more based on fear. It is not based on faith. So if a fearful man gets panicked, he starts to hoard. It's not from God. God doesn't bless hoarders. He blesses people who walk by faith, obey his word, obey a God idea, take it as a harvest principle, and save accordingly. Remember, hoarding would have made unavailable, even in the years of plenty, food for people to eat. That was not the idea that God gave. The idea was take the fifth part. I want you to write this down, please. It is a principle. Many people read this portion of scripture. They don't, they don't spend time. They don't even deal with it because they feel that to deal with it is going to bring them into a lot of criticism. You don't worry about criticism. You just have to listen to the word of God, obey, so that you make it through a time of famine. Hoarding would have been like this if Joseph had said, in the seven years of plenty, let no one eat. Let only one-fifth be available for the people. And all the rest Listen carefully. Hoarding, the principle of hoarding versus saving. Only one-fifth available to the people to eat in the time of plenty. All the rest must be stored. That would have amounted to a fear principle, not a faith principle, a principle of hoarding, which is exactly opposite to what the Holy Spirit is teaching. The Holy Spirit said, in the time of plenty, one-fifth being put aside is more than sufficient. Are you listening? Are you listening? Some of you have to listen to the Holy Spirit because people have 
lived more in fear than in faith. That's why I told you and tell you time and again. It's amazing when you let the Holy Spirit speak to you and open the eyes of your understanding. You see the difference in the mentality of people. He didn't say in the years of plenty, seven years of plenty, just eat one-fifth and store up the rest. No, that would have been hoarding. He said, let all the people eat well. But one-fifth must be stored in the cities. Call them food cities. Okay? Now let's keep reading. Verse 37, And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Always a God idea is good. A God idea will always be received with gladness. Especially for those who are desperate for answers. Remember, an angry Pharaoh would have been a terrible person to deal with by everyone in the court that day. If Pharaoh had not got an answer, surely the magicians would have had to pay, with it, pay for it with their lives. And that anger, he would have revealed it later to some of the ones who were even working with him. Because his spirit was so troubled by what he saw. Now, he is happy. His courtiers are happy. The magicians who didn't have an answer, they are happy. Everyone who's heard what this young Hebrew man, young man has spoken, they feel it's good. And the Bible says, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is. I'm going to stop with this place and we're going to continue this teaching next week. But ask yourself this question. Can someone look at you and say, you put your name there, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Can people look at you and say, the Spirit of God is in this man. The Spirit of God is in this woman. You can't find a better person. You can't find someone who has a better answer. Honestly ask yourself this question. Are you trying to push yourself onto people? Or are people able to say and ask this question to themselves? And in unity answer, we can't find anyone else except this man or this woman in whom the Spirit of God is. That should be the way in which you and I bring the God idea and stand before people. When we stand with the God idea before people, it's not we forcing our ideas on people. We put forth the idea of God and everybody believes there's no better idea than this idea. This is a good idea. It's a God, Holy Spirit inspired idea. We're going to pray. But I want you to keep this before you till we meet next week, God willing. This question, am I that person? Can someone look at me and say, can we find such a person like this in whom the Spirit of God is. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we are so grateful for the life and the testimony of Joseph. We are grateful, O oh Father, that not only did he sensitize Pharaoh about the God alert, but he showed Pharaoh that you are the source of every good thing. You're the source of not only the God alert, but you're also the source of the God idea and the God solution to man's dilemmas and to everything that troubles the spirit of a man. Father, we thank you because famines are bad. Famines are evil. Famines are death dominated events 
that come to erase the memory of everything good in our lives. Oh precious Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, oh Father, that your blessed Holy Spirit will make your people walk with that one thought that is implanted into their minds that will take them out of a situation that is famine-like. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let them have enough sense to understand that when you speak about the principle of saving, you are also warning and telling us you are against the principle of hoarding. Because it doesn't come from you and it is, doesn't spring from your spirit. And it is not some reaction to faith and the life of faith. But it is more fear oriented, fear dominated. And it comes from the evil one. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus for transformation. That this month of April bring forth abundant blessing in the life of your children. In the name of Jesus. The work of Calvary and the effects of Calvary be seen every day in the lives of your children. Let Jesus' death not be in vain, O oh Father. But let them see the blessing that comes from the throne of grace as a result of all that Christ did for them on the cross at Calvary. Thank you, Father. Cover them under the blood, under the blood of Jesus. Let their days be full of the plentiful presence of the Holy Spirit. His counsel, his wisdom, his understanding, the discretion that comes from him, the prudence that comes from him. O oh, mighty Father, commit people into your hands, O oh God, especially the ones who are seriously considering the question that was raised by Pharaoh as applicable to their lives. I pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, may they see the difference between pushing their ideas on people and what a God idea can do in the midst of even unbelievers. Because the God idea was presented in the midst of Pharaoh and his entire Egyptian government and officers and magicians who are all out of tune with you, O oh Father. And yet, all of them agreed there was nothing better than that God idea. It was good. So let it be, I pray, in the name of Jesus, for your glory. We thank you, Lord, for the mighty things that you're opening up to your people. May this wisdom key open doors of opportunity for them. Thank you, Lord. May they be the harvest you planned for the lives of people who are in darkness and in great need. We give you all thanks and praise for miracles that are happening, signs and wonders that are taking place, healings that are taking place for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Everybody said, Amen and Amen. And may the blessing of God the Father, the blessing of God the Son, and the blessing of God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us both now and until Jesus comes again namade andavaragi yesu christun kirubayum pidavagiya devanen anbum tho ya parisutha aviyanade aikyamum namodu kuda indrum endrum irpadaga amen and amen hallelujah hallelujah be of good cheer our god is not mocked He's totally in charge of every man's life. Like I was sharing just the other week in Christ Chapel. God doesn't have plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E. He has only one plan. And that plan, the Bible says, is a plan of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God doesn't know of plan B and plan C. He's not a failure. He's not a person who fails. When he begins a good work, the Bible says, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is the assurance we have of the God we serve, the God of the Bible, who has revealed himself 
to us through the person of his son the lord jesus christ be of good cheer share this teaching link with somebody let their lives also be profitable like i told you you have seven days in a week seven days of opportunity to continually keep being a good news messenger don't do just do it once remember what we heard when we began this year josh took the arrow and just shot it three times into the ground and stopped elijah elisha was angry with him he said you should have shot six times seven times why because then you would have vanquished the entire army of syria think about it if you are only shot six times or seven times that's a complete week you could have destroyed every opposition to the gospel of reconciliation use the word as an arrow use it to touch lives don't quit being a good news messenger believe me the rewards that god will give you some day for being diligent in taking this word of reconciliation to people will be something far beyond what you can even ask or think god bless you let this week continue to be a week of great blessing in your life so you can be a blessing to others hallelujah stuti mahima ella kundu devuni kichadamu hallelujah stuti mahima ella kundu devuni kichadamu a hallelujah 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 a hallelujah Alleluia stuti mahima ella kundu devuni kichadamu Alleluia stuti mahima ella kundu devuni kichadamu Alla sainya mulaku vadhipati aina ఆ దేవుని స్తుతించదము అల సైన్యములకు అధిపతి అయిన ఆ దేవుని స్తుతించదము అల సాంద్రములను దాతించిన ఆ యహోవాను స్తుతించదము అల సాంద్రములను దాటిం china aye ho vanu stutin chedamu hallelujah stuti mahima ella kundu devuni ki chedamu hallelujah stuti mahima ella kundu devuni ki chedamu make sure you don't miss receiving our free monthly newsletter the pulpit which contains a four part teaching series on various bible topics that will help you live in victory you can read it online by going to christchapel.in and click on ebook library where you will find all our newsletters available to receive a physical copy of pulpit you can go to christchapel.in and click on join now and fill in your complete postal mailing address along with your contact mobile number and we will be happy to send it to you free and postpaid should you want to receive the newsletter via email do include your request along with your current email id thank you and god bless